You know, the sister was talking there about, uh, about coincidences, uh, that the world call them coincidences, but we don't, about certain songs and you just pick them and, and they relate to something. I used to run a Friday night worship in, um, in Maryborough Church in Queensland and uh, I'd have all these video clips of different songs, different hymns, and I'd have a theme. And so I would read these verses related to the theme and then just push the PowerPoint and it would, it would play a beautiful hymn. And then I'd come back and read something else and it was just this beautiful Friday night tranquil um, worship time. I remember this one time, because it took me 10 hours during the week to, to uh, prepare for this uh, just 45 minutes. And I remember this one week I was so busy that I, I said to Sari, uh, Sari, you just uh, pick a, uh, what was it, a couple of songs yourself, you know, and um, I haven't got time and we'll just put them in there towards the end, right? And now, of course, I always prayed for God to be there. And I'd already seen many miracles, you know, where my computer would just, as we finished, run out of battery, you know, because it only could last about 45 minutes. I was always nervous to go over time. This one night, I got towards the end, the last couple songs, right? And, um, and I said to Siri, uh, all you have to do is come up, push the button, and it'll, it'll come on, right? And all you have to do is just read the... Uh, the connective quote or something like that, but just push the button to whatever those songs that you chose, right? Those last two random songs. So I was sitting down there and uh, we read about, um, we're speaking about Jesus on the Lake of Galilee in the boat with Peter, right? And then she pushes the button and goes to sit down and there's a picture that she chose of Jesus standing in the boat with Peter in Galilee and it was a song all about that. And my heart started pounding, you know, because I knew, especially after we'd been running it for a while, just how much. Okay, so yes, you can call that coincidences. But then she goes up and starts reading uh, reading what I'd put down there, what I'd put down about Jesus' second coming and coming in the clouds of glory. Then she pushes her song and sits down and it's that big picture of Jesus coming in those clouds. You know that really famous one? Right, with a song about that. I'm getting goosebumps even now telling you. I couldn't help but tears ran down my face, you know, as we knew that our meeting was blessed and that God was there to make up for our little time constraints or whatever. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? We rely too much on ourselves quite often, but we like to be prepared, don't we? Well, it's good to be here. It's good to be down in New South Wales after our wilderness journey. Up in Queensland, that's a story. But, um, but like I said earlier, Sari and I, I was raised in the church, and as I told you, and, and it was my wife leaving me that humbled me greatly and um, brought me back to Jesus. And I had no idea that he was so real. Uh, so I guess I was raised and I believed, as a deist would believe, that Jesus Christ, yeah, he existed, and the Bible's true, but he's over there, you know. Um, but the Lord, and I prayed for miracles and I prayed for signs. Don't be afraid to, you know, because he's very willing to to give you some that'll stun your life. And I was profoundly touched by many, many, many miracles. And um, there was one in particular, and I'll tell that another time maybe in a testimony, that I was so profoundly touched that I suddenly went from a deist knowing that God was over there somewhere to a theist, who knows that he is a God of a personal relationship and brought him right to me and the hairs stood on the back of my neck and I was suddenly aware of the God upon my life and I felt embarrassed and naked and ashamed of myself, you know, in his presence. And I've never looked back from that spot as far as my feelings for him and that's when I, at the moment, I dedicated my life to him because I made a little, little deal with him tell you some other time. Alrighty, today's sermon. Today's sermon, I believe, is the most important need of the Christian church today because this need is a matter of life and death. Your life or death. My life or death. And it's about being either inside a door or outside the door. 
So let me ask you a question. In the time of Noah, where was it best to be? Inside the door or outside the door? Inside the door. That's where Jesus wanted them to be, was inside the door. And Jesus stands, and we know from Scripture, that he stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks, doesn't he? And he, and he does that. He knocks at our hearts. And so where does he want to be? He wants to be in our hearts, doesn't he? He wants to be in our hearts, in our hearts, so, you, so that you can be with him, right? Now listen carefully, so that you can be with him. Jesus wants to be in your heart so you can be with him. Jesus doesn't want to be with you. Jesus wants you to be with him. Do you understand that? You understand? He wants you to be where he is, right? He wants you to be where he is. And the door represents choice. It's just simply a point of choice. And we can open it or we, we don't have to open it. It can be on the inside or the outside. The door represents you having to make a choice in this world. And he will knock, but he will not force you to open that door. But you can open it while there is time. But once he closes that, nobody's going to open it. It'll be too late. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father... I find myself here at Olsonville Church preaching your word. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you will prepare all of our hearts for the Holy Spirit and that we will be inspired to a close relationship with Jesus, a saving relationship with Jesus, not just the knowledge of him, not just love the idea of Jesus, but to be in love with Jesus, that we would die for him as we would die for our own children. This is our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 25. We're going to stay in there except for one or two other verses. We're going to stay in there for the whole sermon. All right? Matthew chapter 25. Now, Matthew chapter 24 and 25, these two chapters are together as one presentation that Jesus gave to the disciples on the Mount of Olives, you may remember. And because the parables of Matthew chapter 25 was given with the end time messages of chapter 24, this makes the parables in 25 more than just good moral stories. They are more than just good bedtime stories. They are prophetic. They are prophecies. They are prophecies predicting the future of the end time, the time we're in now. So we're going to study the parables of the ten virgins here today. So let's start in chapter 25, verse 1, and let's read the first verse. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. So the Bible says what? There is 10 virgins. Therefore, we're talking about women. We're talking about women in prophecy code. We're talking about women. And in the Bible, what does woman represent? Church. The church? A church. It represents a church. But what type of church are we studying here? Because it could be an apostate church, because they are virgins, we are studying pure church, a pure church right here. And the Bible says that they took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom, which means they were waiting for the coming of Jesus, we can say. They were waiting for the coming of Jesus. And if you continue to read in verse 2, now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Five wise, five foolish. The Bible doesn't say that five were wise and five were harlots, does it? It says they are all ten were virgin churches. Now we know that there are ten virgins, five wise, 
and five that are foolish. And when you look at the parable to the conclusion, you will see that the five foolish ones, the pure church ones, five foolish ones, were lost. They were lost. So based upon this, my friends, we can deduct that it is possible for you and I to be part of a pure church, but it is possible to be lost as a virgin if we're foolish. If we're foolish. Now, at least at the beginning of this parable, they all went out to meet the bridegroom. All ten of them went out to meet the bridegroom. And the Bible says that they had what with them? What did they have? They had lamps, didn't they? And so what, therefore, is the lamp for? It's to give light. To give light. So in order to give light, what do we have to have in the lamp? We have to have oil. Therefore, in order to give light, we have to have a lamp and oil the oil together, right? If we just have one of these things, can we give light? Empty lamp, oil. So what is the meaning then? Because we're talking prophecy, we're talking symbolism. What is the meaning then of the lamp? And we won't turn to this, but Psalm 119 and verse 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Lamp represents the truth. The lamp represents the truth. The word of God, it is truth. Okay. So therefore, what's the meaning of the oil? According to Zechariah 4, 1 to 6, oil represents, and we commonly know, don't we? Oil represents the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus, you remember, spoke to the woman at the well in John 4, 24. And he said, those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth. Therefore, in order to have light, we have to have Holy Spirit and we have to have truth. In order to give light, we have to have truth, but it must be mixed with the Holy Spirit. Do you agree? Can we have light by just having a lamp with no oil? And we asked that before. So an empty lamp, no, no light. Empty light. I've got the truth, you could say. Here's my lamp. I've got the truth. I know the word of God. I know the doctrines. But can we give light with this? Just with the Bible and without the Holy Spirit. Without the Word. Our lamp is empty. Can we give light just because we have oil? This is a good question. Without the lamp. Without the Word. Just Holy Spirit. Can we give light just with the oil? I mean, the prophets of old, Abraham didn't have scriptures. The word of the Lord came to him. What did he test it against? Yeah, so what we're talking about here, we're not talking about God speaking to his prophets. We're talking about Holy Spirit illuminating our mind, leading us into all truth. This is what we're talking about here, right? Checking the Holy Spirit or what voice is speaking to us by the Word of God. Because you must be careful what voice is speaking to you. You know, there, there are people and there are churches that emphasize you just need the oil. You just need the oil. That's what they emphasize. I've got the Holy Spirit. And they say, don't worry so much about the little details. Don't worry about the, these doctrines so much. As long as you have the Holy Spirit, you can join the light of Jesus. 
Now, some talk like that and some claim that. But they don't have a biblical structure. They don't have biblical foundations. No truth that can support the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And it is dangerous to what voice you're listening to. So the Bible teaches that in order for us to have light, we have to have truth and the Holy Spirit. Do you agree? Yes. So we need these two things. Now, in the beginning of this parable, all the virgins had the truth, it seems like, and they all have the Holy Spirit in their lamps. Okay, all 10 of them. So what's the problem? Why are some of them foolish Let's see. Let's go on. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 3, reading on. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. What does it mean that they took no oil just here? They must have had oil in their lamps because when you read about these wise virgins in chapter 4, let's read 4. But the wise took oil in their vessel with their lamp. So therefore they all had oil in their lamps. The foolish as well. So, so then the wise took oil in their lamps but also in something called their vessel. And the foolish took oil in their lamps but they took nothing, they took no vessel with them. So now we're starting to see a little different between the two. The wise took oil in their lamps, but not their vessel. So what were the foolish ones then? This stands to us to ask a question. What were the foolish ones thinking? What was their, their line, train of thinking? What was going on with their thinking? Why didn't they take extra oil? So what were the foolish ones we're talking about? Now, the wise ones, they did take extra oil. And because they were probably thinking, well, you never know. There could be a delay. Things could change. So we're just going to take extra oil. But the foolish didn't take extra oil. Why? I put it to use because they thought the bridegroom would come before their oil ran out. Okay? They put some time type of time setting, time frame to the coming of the bridegroom. This group were time setters. I'm expecting the bridegroom to come at a certain time before my oil runs out. And my friends, if any of us are time setters, then according to this, we may be foolish virgins. Let's see. But the wise ones, are they thinking, yes, 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 the bridegroom may indeed come at a certain time. They study the scriptures. But things can change. There could be a delay. I don't know. Could be. Just in case, I'm going to take extra oil. So, if we want to be a wise virgin, we need to have oil in our lamp, but also in our vessel, in two places, our vessel. Now, we know that the, the lamp represents the truth, the word of God, and the oil represents the Holy Spirit. We've seen that. But now we have this vessel. What does that represent? What do you think that might represent, what it might mean? Us? Yes. Well, let's look at 2 Corinthians. Everyone go to 2 Corinthians, but put your finger in Matthew 25 and we'll come back. Excuse me. Second Corinthians 4, chapter 4. And we'll start in verse 7. Second Corinthians 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of ourself. When Paul was talking about the earthen vessels here, scholars agree, scholars agree that he was talking about our soul, our living soul. So therefore, what treasure 
should we be putting in our earthen vessel, in our soul? What treasure? Now, if you read the verse before, so 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, the verse before says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what treasure then? What treasure do we need in our soul, in our vessel? It is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. What's another way you could say this? The light of the knowledge of the character of God as expressed in Jesus Christ. Because the glory of God is his character. The light of the knowledge of the character of God as expressed in Jesus Christ. So what's going on here? The wise ones took oil in their vessel. Their vessel. So what does that really mean? The wise received the Holy Spirit in two places. They received firstly in their lamps and they received the Holy Spirit in their vessel. Okay? The Holy Spirit in the lamp led them, led them to understand the Bible truths. Holy Spirit illuminating your mind to understand that this is truth and the pathway of truth and the correct understanding of Scripture. They're understanding all the Bible teachings. They're understanding the prophecies. So they have the Holy Spirit to give them the light of the teaching of the Bible. But they also have the Holy Spirit in their vessel. Why in their vessel? Their soul. Because they were experiencing Holy Spirit, character, transformation. The Holy Spirit working in their soul, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God or the character of God as expressed in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you know, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. My Father and I are one. So the wise were not just justified by faith, they're on a journey of sanctification, God's character being imparted into one's soul. They were becoming more like Jesus. But the wise ones, foolish ones, the foolish ones, yes, they're virgins. Why? Because of what they believe. They understand the doctrines. Their faith is based upon the Holy Spirit leading them to understand truth. They are at least in the right movement, the right teaching, in the right church, you may say. The Holy Spirit has led them into all truth, and that's why they're virgins. But they're foolish virgins. Why? Why? They are excited about the coming of the bridegroom, and they're expecting that he might come at a certain time, which is fantastic, but their character is not transformed by the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is not truly living within their soul. The Word of God has not changed them. They're resisting. They're resisting the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that brings about character transformation. Yes, I know the truth, but has the truth changed me? The midnight hour will come, my friends, upon this earth, and there will be no light there will be no Bibles, and without it, the foolish virgins can't see their way. They will be blind. We must take this in and make it part of us. If you take that off, I still have the word inside me. That's why we need to study. And this is how you can be lost. You may be in the right church, but if your character is not being transformed by the Holy Spirit, if Jesus is not truly living in your heart, the Word of God is not living in us as a church, as a people, then we are foolish virgins and we will be lost with our truth. And when you look at this parable, in the beginning, nobody knew who was who. Who was wise and who was foolish? Nobody knew who were who. Don't imagine that these wise ones said to the foolish, hey, come with us 
Come with us into the, into the marriage supper. No, nobody knew. They all look the same. They all look the same. And this is what it's meant by the wheat and tares growing together. Nobody knows. Always. Some may be apparent. Reading on to verse 5. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 5. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Now what does it mean that they slumbered and slept? Because this sounds like apostasy. Because we're talking about a church here that has the truth with the Holy Spirit. And that church slumbered and slept. (coughs) Excuse me. No, I don't think we're talking about apostasy here. There was some sort of delay to the coming of the bridegroom. Have we experienced in our church history a delay with some time setting? Yes, indeed. No, I don't believe we're talking about apostasy. There was a delay. I think they were at a point of confusion. And they weren't sure what's happening. They were tired and it was really late at night and they all just slumbered and they slept. All ten of them. All ten of them. Even the wise ones. So it's not apostasy we're talking here. Matthew 25 and verse 6, let's read on. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. So who made that call? This is interesting. Who made that call? It wasn't one of the ten virgins, so therefore not everyone was asleep. (coughs) Excuse me, I got a tickle. So not everyone was asleep. There was somebody watching. Somebody kept looking, kept studying. You remember also when Jesus, the Jews didn't know when Jesus was coming. I'll probably need a drink. But there was these uh, shepherds in the field that were watching and came to see the baby Jesus, but not God's people. So called. Everyone was asleep, but the ten virgins were. They were. So the Bible says to go and meet them at midnight, we've read. Thank you very much. Excellent. (coughs) Go out and meet them at midnight. So what's our body say at midnight? What are we supposed to do at midnight, generally? Sleep. Please listen. Your body, your human nature, your natural tendencies of the hour of the night says to you, sleep when it is so natural. It should be okay. It should be okay. It's natural. That's understandable. It is so natural for your body at midnight to go to sleep. But Jesus is saying in this parable, he is saying... You have to resist your natural desires in order to respond. And my friends, in the last day, a call will be be made where you and I will have to resist our natural tendencies, our normal feelings. Even the foolish virgins woke up. Even the foolish virgins woke up and got up. So until, up until that point, at the midnight cry, they still all look the same. They all look the same. Continuing in verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. All the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Another way of saying this is all the virgins arose and they ignited their lamps. Time will come, my friends, when you have to resist those natural currents, something that feels normal to you. Resist against that and do something that's extraordinary. And during that time, 
you will need to ignite your lamp. Even up to the point that they were trimming their lamps, they all looked the same as each other. They all looked the same. But then, what comes after makes the big difference. They all trimmed their lamps, so to speak. But only five of them were able to light their lamps and to shine bright. Now, what does it mean that they trimmed their lamps? What does this mean? Why would Jesus mention trimming their lamps? Why not just say light their lamps? What's another word for trim? To cut their lamps. Cut. So what were they cutting? They were cutting the wick. They were cutting away the unwanted part. So they're cutting away the black part, the black bit, right? Why? Because they needed to cut away the black part so the lamp could shine brighter. So the question is, what is, it, what is this black part, the, the burnt part, represent in this parable? Was it something good or bad? Bad? It burnt one time. It's not all bad. It shined one time. So it can't be all bad. When you cut away the burnt, the black, burnt, unwanted part, you're cutting away something that used to shine. It is your previous experience in shining the light. Sometimes, not that we should forget about our past good spiritual experiences, we shouldn't forget about them, but in a moment of emergency, in a moment of a new scene, in the moment of a crisis, when you are entering into a new experience, you cannot rely on your previous experience, relying on yourself, you must cut it away to move forward. Why? We learn from our experiences. Because this is a new experience and you need to rely on the Holy Spirit and not on yourself. Building your great wealth of knowledge and now not needing Jesus, we need to always rely on the Holy Spirit as we enter into a new chapter in our Christian life experience if we are to shine bright for Jesus and not just go out. Now you have heard people say in the church, I'm sure, probably a little proudly maybe, back 12 months ago we had a great Daniel seminar and we used to do this and we used to do that in the church and that's great, that's great. But the question is, what are we doing now? What are we doing now? Yes, it was good what we did in the past, but if we keep holding on to that as our glory, our light may just run out. If we are not doing something today for Jesus' kingdom. When you cut away the, the wick, in order to burn a new wick, or the better part, what must we have in the cases of these virgins? We need to have new oil. It has drawn all the oil out. So we need oil. And without oil, what would happen to that wick? It would just burn out, wouldn't it? It would burn out. It would just burn out, just like pastors or those working in the church, but we hear it a lot with pastors, that burn out. Could it be that they're not relying on the Holy Spirit but their great wealth of accumulated knowledge? We need Jesus to... To continue, we need the Holy Spirit. So, therefore, my friends, it is important for us to have extra oil. Why? Because of the new experience. We need that daily anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let's continue to read in verse 8. And the foolish said to the wise, 
Give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. Let me ask you, let me ask you, if, if one of your friends asked you to share, what would you normally do? You would share. But in this case, they didn't. Verse 9. But the wise answered saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. Why can't the five virgins just let, lend them a bit of oil? The bridegroom's coming. You remember the story of uh, Elijah where when the drought was on, he came into a town and came across a lady and said, uh, could you make me some, some food? And she said, well, I've only got a little bit of oil and some bread and I'll make that and my son and I will die. She shared. So are we talking about that? That type of sharing? I remember we're talking symbolic. Why can't these wise virgins share? Why don't they share? It's not because they don't want to share. It's because they can't share. They can't give their oil. And why can't they give it? Because they cannot give the Holy Spirit. We cannot give what is in the vessel. And what's in the vessel? What does that represent? It represents you. It represents your soul. So what's in the vessel? In your soul? It's the Holy Spirit in your soul. And the Holy Spirit doing what in your soul? The Holy Spirit transforming your character. Your character. And we cannot give away our character. It's impossible. Reading on in verse 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. The door was shut. So based upon this parable, my friends, and don't please misunderstand me, but based upon this parable that we're reading, there was a clear condition to the following of the bridegroom. We cannot follow the bridegroom unless the lamp was burning, like the wise. If our lamp is not burning, my friends, we cannot follow Jesus according to this parable, yes or no. That seems to be the condition. That's the only way we can go in with the bridegroom into the marriage supper, like the wise, if our lamp is burning bright. We can see our way. A reading on in verse 11, and we will read verse 12. Verse 11, afterward the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Verse 12, but he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Let me ask you something. If you're having a birthday party or a dinner party or something at your place and some of your friends, the ones that have been invited, they come late, do you say, I don't know you when you open the door? Or just shout it from behind the door, in this case. Go away. Who are you? I don't know you. It sounds really mean, doesn't it? Sounds really mean. So what's going on? Apparently that these foolish virgins have got their lamps burning now. Yes or no? The foolish ones, because they are now coming to the marriage supper. They can see their way. So how come they weren't allowed in? Why not? They have their lamps burning in the problem before and the uh, condition was you had to have your lamp burning. And now they've got it burning. And they're at the door with a burning lamp. Why can't they go in? Why can't they go in? Are you following me? The burning lamp, illuminated Bible by the Holy Spirit. The lamp is to lead us to Jesus. But we enter into the kingdom of Jesus because we are with Jesus. So we've moved past this and grabbed on to where this is pointing. This is like a finger. I don't know if any of you have heard this example. This is a finger pointing the way to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or you'll miss all the heavenly glory. Have you heard that? What does that mean? This is pointing to something much greater. We don't get bogged here. 
I know my Bible so well. All right. I know my Jesus so well. We need to go there. So they had the truth, the foolish virgins. But they didn't have Jesus. They weren't there. We don't get saved because the truth led me to Jesus. And because of that, oh, sorry, sorry. We don't get saved because I have the lamp. I have the truth. I have the Holy Spirit, even. No, we get saved because the truth led me to Jesus. And because of that, I hold on to him. And he enters and I go with him in glory. So the foolish ones, they came without. They came without Jesus. Just the knowledge of him. So my question to you is, let's just summarise. Let's just summarise. What's the bottom line? What's the bottom line? How do we get extra oil in our vessel? Like the wise. That's the bottom line question here today. How do we get extra oil? Now in the old days, in the biblical days, even now, how do they get oil? Usually from olives. But in biblical day, it was mainly from olives. And what did they do with these olives to get oil? They crushed them. They crushed them and the oil would, would come out. They would press them. And they'd become like, like powdery dust and the oil would come out and separate from that. Now there's a spiritual lesson in this. There's a spiritual lesson. In order to receive the Holy Spirit into our lives, we must first be crushed and become totally nothing. If we don't experience that turning into dust, there is no recreation. Because when you think about it, God created man out of dust. And in order to be recreated, we have to become dust spiritually. Spiritually. We have to become nothing. And when we become nothing, God can make something. And I will tell you when I tell the testimony maybe some other time, I was so proud God couldn't make something out of me until I humbled myself. I emptied myself. There was no room for him. We have to make room. Now, if you think you're a big person, as I did, more important than your brothers and sisters in church here, God cannot make a new character in you. We have to empty ourselves and receive in order to receive and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I encourage you to empty yourself of yourself which is a hard thing to do. Now there is a place in the Bible and it's called Gethsemane, right? And do you know what Gethsemane means? Do you know what Gethsemane means? It means oil pressing. Because, you know, there was the olive trees and, um, and they had the press there. And that's where they'd press the oil. And that was the garden of oil pressing, um, Gethsemane. And what was Jesus doing in Gethsemane, you remember, right at the end? He went there many times, but what was he doing at the end? Do you remember? He was praying. He was praying. And do you remember what he was praying about? Remember, we're talking here about how to get oil in our vessel, the bottom line, how to be wise. So Jesus was praying about what? Yes. He was praying that if it's possible for this cup to pass from me, but he said, not my will, but God's will be done, Jesus said. And he prayed this prayer three times. So what does that say? It was hard even for Jesus in his flesh, in his natural tendencies, to endure. It was hard for that cup of condemnation that was come, coming upon him. And let me just move away for a second. Can you imagine, have you, have you meditated on that? That here Jesus is coming and into the garden, he knows what's going to happen to him and now his father is putting the guilt and sin of every human being upon him. 
Have you had guilt only once in your life that was so pressing you down that it itself made you sick, can develop cancer in you? And how powerful that is? Could you imagine a few billion of those on top of you, on top of our Saviour's shoulders? And his father separating from him because he made him sin? Pressed him down to the point where the Bible talks about he had sweat like great droplets of blood. And some of us can say it was like great droplets of blood. But doctors can tell you that the body under tremendous stress will seep blood through your capillaries and such and you can actually sweat blood. So scholars believe that it's very possible that's exactly what was happening to the Saviour. He was under such stress that he was sweating blood and if the angel hadn't come, just the guilt alone of our sins would have killed our Saviour. But he was revived to go to the cross to fulfill all prophecy. You know, people, people say, oh, yeah, well, hundreds of thousands of people died on the cross. Why is Jesus different? Oh, when you study it, is, there's a thousand reasons why it was more than just one person going on the cross. Just him coming from heaven alone and becoming sin for us. You know, and the pain he endured was greater than the physical pain. You know, and he still, his will was, I trust you, Father. I trust you, Father. And the spirit of prophecy says he couldn't see through the portals of the grave, which means he couldn't see to the resurrection that he was going to pass on because of his separation from God. So he died the second death. Who has died the second death yet? Nobody. Only Jesus did. You know that hanging on the cross, we see it in the movies, they're there suffering, but it's not like just that. You know that they fidget massively, they move massively, right? Because they string them so wide, right, that their legs get tired, right? So after a while, they, they go down because of the way they're situated and they start suffocating and their shoulders come out of joint, right? And then because of that, they're trying to get a breath. They push against the nails, right, and take a breath. And they go down and they just keep doing this constantly. And they fatigue and kill themselves, right? They fatigue their legs to this unbelievable. They, you know, trying to grab a breath because the life wants to keep going. Excruciating is where it gets its word. Why they spat on him. Could you imagine being nailed on a cross for your children? You'd do that, wouldn't you? I'm digressing a bit here, but I'm just passionate about this. Would you not be crucified for your child, to save your child? I don't have to ask you. If you're a mother or father, your love is so great, you'd do that in a second, Right? But do you imagine your child standing in front of you, spitting on you and hating you and rejecting you? And people go, well, how could he do that? I, I would have cursed him, which is what people did. But would you curse your child because you know your child doesn't know you? It's forgotten about you at a young age. But you know it's your child? What would you say? Forgive him, Father. For my son doesn't know me. My child doesn't know me. That's why Jesus said those things, hey? Because he's looking at his children who don't know him. And he has only love for them. So Jesus is making this prayer. He, he didn't physically want this cup of condemnation, but he wanted the will of God greater than anything. So he relied on his father, not on himself, on his fleshly will. He just gave it to his father. Jesus totally submitted himself to the will of the father. And he said, not my will, but your will be done in my life. So Jesus, in Gethsemane, he prayed the prayer of total submission to the father. No reliance on himself whatsoever. 
So therefore, in order for us to experience receiving more of the Holy Spirit, we have to have a similar experience to Jesus had in Gethsemane. We need to have our own Gethsemanes, friends. We need to have a prayer like Jesus prayed because it was in Gethsemane was the place where Jesus made that final decision and he got up and he got ready for the cross for us, for Calvary. And my friends, in the last days, in the last days, you and I will bear our own crosses. But we have to have our own Gethsemane first, as Jesus did. So what kind of prayer should we pray? Not my will, just like Jesus. Not my will, but your will be done, Father. Lord, transform my life. I'm pushing my desires away. Not my will, but your will be done. My desires don't even want to do your will, Father. My human flesh is against your will, Father. My flesh doesn't want to do what you want. But Lord, Lord, I pray. I know the truth. I've been led into the truth. But please transform me, because I know it's right. And totally change my character because it's against me. Help me, Lord, to submit to you. If we're not having a prayer something like this, like Jesus's, then we may be foolish virgins. You may be foolish virgins. You know, the virgins are over here talking and they're saying things like this. I know about the end time prophecy and they're quite proud. End time prophecies and I know what it says in Daniel and I know all about the Sabbath and I know all about the Bible and the truth of the Bible. But the wise, the wise are over here and they're saying, yes, we know about the prophecies. Yes, we do. And we know about Daniel and we know about the Bible truths. But they're saying, Lord, Lord, change me. I know Jesus is coming soon. I know I want to be more like him. Change me, Father. Change my character. Make me a better person, more like Jesus. Please give me the heart of Jesus to be more like him. Not my will, but your will be done, Father. In my life. And over here, the foolish are saying, well, I'm glad I'm in the right church. You know, we'll get together and we'll do, we'll do uh, Bible prophecies and we'll do talks and, and uh, we'll get Bible studies going and we'll get everybody in the church ready for the second coming of Jesus. And that's great. <coughs> but the wise, the wise ones, we know the Bible prophecies and we know where they're pointing and we are prepared to proclaim them. But we are going to proclaim them this way. Fear God. And give glory to him. Give glory to him and reflect his character for the hour of his judgment has come. And the judgment is not based upon what prophecy we know. The judgment is based upon whose character we're reflecting. Matthew 21. Verse 21, 23. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and do many wonderful deeds. And then he will declare to us, I never knew you. Go away from me, you lawbreaker. So my friends, Do we have any foolish virgins here this morning? If the Lord is calling you and you feel that you are a foolish virgin, then today you need to say, Lord, Lord, help me become wise. Brothers and sisters, in closing, we need to wake up out of our slumber and our confidence For when we wake up, Jesus will be standing there with open arms to fill us with the Holy Spirit, with the gift. Miracles will happen in your life. And when the work is done, he will say that it is finished and return to those who are awake and shining bright. And he will lead us into his glory. You know... 
The Lord of glory died for us. Jesus Christ went from being the King of kings and the Lord of lords and he became the sin bearer where this universe maker became mankind's saviour. You know, his office is manifold and his promise is sure. His life is matchless and his goodness is limitless. His mercy is enough and his grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He is indestructible. He is indescribable. He is incomprehensible. He is inescapable. He is invincible. He is irresistible. He is irrefutable. And I can't get him out of my mind and I can't get him out of my heart. I can't outlive him and I can't live without him. And you know those Pharisees, they couldn't stand him, but they found they couldn't stop him. Satan tried to tempt him, but found he couldn't trip him. Pilate examined him on trial, but found no fault in him. The Romans crucified him, and they couldn't take his life. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. Uh, Let's bow our heads. Father... Your children are sitting here that you love so much and you want us to know you like a son, like a daughter knows a father and mother. You want an intimate relationship with us, not just a passing g'day, but you want to spend time. You want us to know your beautiful character, the glory of God. You want us to be there with you because you know what you have for us. And we sit here and we, we build our pride and we squabble and we have our petty ways. But Lord, you know that and you died anyway. Because you love us so much and you know what we can be with you dwelling within us and recreated to the time before. Before sin entered the world. Father, forgive us for our sins. And give us the Holy Spirit that we will move further than just understanding the Bible, that the Bible will lead us to the author and the saviour. Save us, Father, in spite of ourselves, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.